So what I originally intended to say to you was I wanted to give you this very conceited, a holistic view of malaria in man with emphasis on the eradication era and the role of anti-malarial drugs. But I realised that some of you were interested in drugs. And um, you will find a few slightly boring historical landmarks in our knowledge up to the 20th century. Um, something about developments in prevention and therapy from roughly 1918, because not too much happened before that, up until 1969, and then some thoughts on the way ahead. First of all, I try to think, where are we in 2012? And I put this down as the five Vs. But anyway, I thought of it in terms of the victims, that's man, as far as we're concerned, the vandals, that's plasmodium, of course, one sort or the other, the victors, Anopheles mosquitoes, the victories that have been made. And there's various things, uh, social and ecological evolution, development of insecticides, development of drugs, the development, hopefully, of vaccines. And some of the vicissitudes, some of the problems, um, some of them are due to environmental challenges, which we do not necessarily do anything about. There's the genetic evolution of the vandals, the, the mosquitoes, and the uh, vectors. There's the question of immunity-resistant parasites looming on the horizon. Drug-resistant parasites, which is your cup of tea, as it were. Vaccine-resistant parasites, perhaps for the future. Um, Insecticide-resistant problems very much to the fore. And then, finally, but not the least at all, failures of man himself. Ignorance, political and economical problems, social instability, wars, contributions to global warming. And I will touch on these points as we go along. Now, we may think we're very smart and everything's being done now, but this is from an old, very old, bamboo manuscript which was shown to me by colleagues in Beijing in 1980 and there the I don't want to turn around but there's a little top of that line on left is the same symbol as used nowadays for Qinghao Artemisia, Artemisia annua of course people didn't know anything about the names of plants they just knew this was something good for treating fevers they didn't know what malaria was um, but it's an old, old story, and it was a very good folk remedy. And this is something we should remember. And really, the next sort of folk remedy which comes into the history books is the quinchona tree. That's the actual flower. I don't know how many of you have seen the flower of the quinine tree. That is it. This particular one, the picture was taken in uh, Madagascar. And she had fever in Peru, was treated with this extract of quinchona bark, and the Jesuits gave us some of this to take back to Europe, where there was a lot of malaria around in those days. That was in 1630. So we then have a big jump from Kinchona to Qinghao. This particular plant, against that beautiful British blue sky, <laughs> for meters, with the tender loving care of my wife, I may say. Anyway, it was a long time before anybody came to know what uh, the active constituent of the um, uh, Tinchona plant was, and uh, this was uh, uh, Pelletien uh, Cabron, too, of course, who discovered the structure of quinine. But that was the story of the discovery of quinine. In the meantime, nobody even knew that um, malaria was something caused by things in the blood. And this was uh, Laveron who actually recognised that there were these peculiar things inside the red cells in people in Algeria, in soldiers in Algeria, who actually had this uh, periodic fever. And that was 1880. And nobody still knew even the life cycle of malaria parasites. Um, interestingly enough, before even that was known, there was a reference to drug combinations. Um, combinations are something that I'm certainly going to talk a lot about, and that you're going to be very interested in. And this was by Goodman and Ehrlich in 1891. This is my improper translation from the German, um, and I've written here, it said, moreover, the important question needs to be resolved of whether a combination of quinine with methylene blue 
uh, could cure infection with the tropical form of malaria, what we now call Plasmodium falciparum, which so frequently resists treatment with quinine alone. Therefore, uh, anybody realized or could demonstrate that there was part of the cycle of the malaria parasite in man that went through the liver. And that was nearly 50 years later, and this was the work of Short, Garman, Cavell, and Shute. Not very much was done about this, um, really, uh, except in Germany, where some work was carried out to try to produce something less toxic than quinine. And um, they, that history I won't go into now, I really don't have time, but there was a lot of medicinal chemistry done before World War II, um, which ended up in the development of hamaquin, minor quinoline of course, uh, even chloroquine itself, which was discarded by the Germans at the time as being too toxic for use, um, and um, mepoquin. But this was a, a big survey carried out under the auspices of NIH, summarized in two ways, one by this very brief book by Bob Coatney and his colleagues, um, and he points out there that it was about 12,000 compounds evaluated in that program, which was an enormous number uh, for the time. And the full details of that are, of course, in a huge volume by Weisselogel, which contains all the details of that so-called enormous survey. Um, meantime, models were being developed, various kinds of models. Um, I won't read them all out too, but I'll give a moment to have a look at that. Um, it ranges all the way down from the very early works with um, the parasites in birds going back to the 1920s. That was the royal test in Canaries, and going up to the present sort of in, in silico techniques which are being used in these days. But one of the biggest, two of the biggest developments there really were the discovery of malaria in rodents by uh, Vinky and the cultivation of falciparum by Traeger and Jensen in 1960, 1986, which is an enormous advance in terms of drug screening and evaluation. Evolution of models throughout the years, we're now in a sort of age of silicon. Interesting, isn't it? Um, quite early in the piece, it was recognized that the, one of the early anti-fold antimalarials produced really towards or just after the end of World War II, namely pyrimethamine, was something which was very effective in man against falciparum, but uh, it was soon recognized uh, that you could quite readily encounter parasites resist falciparum, resistant to that type of antifold. It was also recognized that if you gave pyrimethamine with sulfonamide, you could actually overcome <coughs> that problem, and this is just an example of one of the first publications on that particular topic, because they actually worked. Um, again, shortly post World War II, uh, the uh, Palais de Nation, which was the original home, as you know, of WHO, um, people there decided to develop or to launch, well, to develop really, a malaria eradication program. And that was in the 50s. And how many of you know that old building, the Palais de Nation? It's a lovely old building, actually. And now it's all brand new building up on top of the hill, of course. That was a lovely place. I left all my pretty pictures behind at home. <laughs> Anyhow, the point is that um, there was a growing body of experts who felt that it should be possible uh, to change the parameters of malaria transmission in such a way that it could be reached, you could reach the point where the um, critical mass, the number of infections new infections coming up um, was exceeded, uh, was, uh, sorry, was below the number of people who were actually getting better, that's putting it in a nutshell. And uh, George MacDonald, who was a fantastic um, uh, mathematician among other things, came up with this now very famous uh, uh, formula showing how you could rate, relate all these different factors which you see listed in front of you. And this, in many ways, was the basis of the original malaria eradication program. And I, mean, I don't want to belittle MacDonald. He was a fantastic epidemiologist, 
and mathematician, and he came up with this formula, which caught everybody's fancy. And they thought you really have only got to knock down the um, amount of uh, mosquitoes which could be infected, the amount of malaria in the blood which could infect the mosquitoes, which is logical, and you'd reach a critical point below which the whole thing would die out. And that fundamentally was the basis of the malaria eradication program. Now, as you see, I went out, um, I joined WHO in 1953 and, and went out to Liberia on what I call a pre-eradication tryout. There was one in Liberia, there was another one in, at least one in Nigeria, to see what could we do with a bucket of DDT and a bottle of chloroquine. And the end story of that, of course, we couldn't do very much. Um, we tried this out also in uh, New Guinea many years later, and so did our Dutch colleagues on what was then Dutch New Guinea, and we both ran parallel programs analyzing all these factors in the field uh, to see uh, how it would work and, you know, what were the chances of eradicating malaria. It was still eradication period, mark you. paper was from 1960, but by that time um, the whole thing had been wound down. No, 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 big part it wasn't. It was still eradication days. I, I was wound down. I came back from New Guinea. Um, so hopping back a few years, back to um, Liberia. Um, it was quite clear for anybody who worked in the field that the idea of just spraying a bit of DDT around and handing out a few chloroquine tablets was not really going to eradicate malaria, come what may, in that very underdeveloped, let's face it, part of West Africa. Uh, these were some of my mosquito collectors. This was the sort of place where um, Anopheles was breeding. Um, and uh, somewhere I may have a picture of one of the villages, but it's typical hinterland West African village of that time. And uh, you know, here we are. Here's, here's one of the villages in the, with the spray team um, in there. And um, we did our best. We, we sprayed every house, which was not the easiest thing to do. And it was. Um, not all that successful. We really only used in that program um, what we had. We had DDT in one sector, we had uh, BHC in another, and we actually had Dieldrin, you know, heaven forbid that word Dieldrin. Anyway, we had Dieldrin. And um, we reduced the numbers of mosquitoes for a while, we reduced the number of the house flies, of which there were plenty at that time, up to a point. Um, come to the house flies, we suddenly realized, and we were living actually, our headquarters was in the area which happened to be part of the Dieldrin area, we suddenly realized that not only were the mosquitoes not responding to the Dieldrin, nor were the flies, and the flies were not just not responding, not being killed, their reproduction rate was shooting up. <laughs> we used to call those of you who remember the old film Alfie, you know, bigger, stronger, etc., etc., we called them Alfie flies. Delphi mosquitoes, because they seemed to resist everything. Um, nobody was quite sure why that was. Uh, some a few years later, one of my students, Anne Ramkaran, took a look at the infectivity of chloroquine-resistant Plasmodium burgii, the rodent parasite, to Anopheles, Anopheles stevensi. And we found that that actually increased uh, in animals treated with chloroquine. And we reckon that this is probably exactly the same thing that was happening with flies. Of course, other people went on to work on fly genetics in relation to insecticides and came up with a very similar sort of argument. This never actually, that of course was published, but our findings on flies were not recognized except one, one place, which I'll mention in a moment. In about 1954, I sent a message back, and this is, there's a lesson here somewhere. I sent a message back to Let's name the name, um, Leonard Bruce Schwartz, great friend of many of us, a man who had the greatest admiration. I sent him a letter back telling, telling him what we found in these flies. End of story. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions from that. <coughs> I won't say more. Just to confirm the sort of thing that uh, we had found, or I found, at about the same period of time, a Swedish group, quite independently from Karolinska, went out to an area of Liberia near Capain, and they actually went back and they looked at the same area, and they found that, and came to the conclusion and published it, that between 1954, which is more or less the time I, I left, which doesn't mean much, of course, and, and 1980, the malaria metric indices that they themselves did 
um, showed that there was almost no change since the time we had been working there, that almost all the vectors were solidly resistant to organochlorides. Okay, their eradication. Was it a dream or a reality? Well, progenitors were mainly epidemiologists. The greatest respect for all of them. Their names are well known to you all. Paul Russell, <coughs> Milo Pampana, who was the head of the malaria section here in the 50s. Very experienced um, Italian. Fred Soper, you know, Arnaldo Gabanon from Caracas, and George Madond himself. Um, what I call the infant feeds for malaria eradication were DDT, uh, the valuable, potential valuable properties of which were actually described by Paul Muller, who worked with the uh, Geige company, who got a Nobel Prize for this, who didn't give me a job when I went to see him, which was his loss. Um, and cause what I call infant feeds, a chloroquine, which was originally derived really from the German compound and further worked by U.S. medicinal chemists. And then the, what I call the emergency medication, which was all kinds of money coming from all sides. Uh, the very, very good, I recommend this to you, those who haven't read it, very good historical book by Packard. Um, I'm not a great one on history, but uh, his is a wonderful book, The Making of a Tropical Disease. For those of you who haven't read it, I'd strongly recommend it. Well, when I decided that um, I'd had enough of Liberia, or Liberia had enough of me, and they nearly threw me out, um, I got a, went back to Geneva and they said, oh, we're sorry you're leaving, can we tempt you to you know, do something else with us? And in the meantime, between coming back from Liberia and going back to see WHO to report in, I got married to this lovely lady in Geneva. And they came. They said to me, well, we'd like to get a medical entomologist. I was working as a medical entomologist, not as a physician in those days. Would you like to go to Nepal? We're going to set up a project in the Nepalese Terai. So I said to my wife in about two weeks, how would you like to go to Nepal? Being a good Swiss lady who does everything her husband suggests, she said yes. And within a fortnight of being married, we ended up in a tent in the Nepalese Terai. That was our honeymoon home. I'm not sure if I got a picture of it. If I did put it up. Anyhow, we spent the next few years trying to eradicate malaria uh, under the direction of um, an Indian doctor who had been working in the Indian malaria program, malaria control program, I should say, um, based on um, Hetara in the Nepalese Terai. Very interesting project. Now, I am sometimes said sometimes said I'm very negative about possibilities of controlling, let's call it controlling malaria. It's not really true. Um, it depends where you are, of course. If you're in an area which lends itself to the transmission of malaria as hollow and dead malaria, okay, we know where we stand or don't stand today. But if you go on some of the marginal areas of malaria transmission, it's another story altogether, particularly as you go to higher altitudes. And of course, we were working at a higher altitude. Now, when we first went there, the Terai was just a massive, dense jungle. The local people lived on the hillsides. They didn't want to go down into the Terai itself because they knew they'd get malaria there. Obviously, they got the malaria from the mosquitoes, got malaria from somebody who had gone. So there was a transmission going on, probably more vivax than, than falciparum. But it was a potentially very valuable area for agriculture. And this was one of the reasons the Nepalese were so keen that somebody would do something to control malaria, clean up the Terai. Um, I was there with my wife from 1954 for several years, and I happened to go back, I think it was 14 years later. Um, this time, instead of walking from Kathmandu to the Terai, which was quite a walk, I can tell you, she was much fitter than I was, um, I went back in a helicopter. 14 years later, that was the Terai. Look at the transformation. One of the bread boxes of the Indian uh, agriculture. Beautiful uh, development of that land. So, you know, you can be very positive, but what happens to the whole agriculture, ecology, economy of a country in an area which is already somewhat on the fringes of transmission, uh, if you go about it, even in the eradication way? And that's what happened in, in Nepal. Well, when I resigned from WHO for the second time, 
and looked around for a job. I didn't quite know where to go to. And uh, long story, cut it short, we ended up in Papua New Guinea. Um, again with my intrepid wife, I won't, I won't say trailing behind me, probably leading me along down the path. Um, and we ended up in a beautiful place up in the north of Papua New Guinea in the Sepik district, uh, very close to the area where Japanese invaders had tried to take over New Guinea during World War II and where they met a lot of opposition, of course, from American troops, Australian troops, and an awful is punctilatus. And it was told me by Robert Black, uh, now deceased, who was one of the big shots in the malaria control program of the Australian army, that one of the weapons they used against the Japanese uh, were bombs, not on the people, certainly not on the indigenous people, but just on the land. They bombed blooming great holes in the land on the coast near where the Japanese were. Punctulatus loved it, read like bilio. The transmission rate of malaria went up. Japanese, who had nothing except pamaquin to protect themselves with, went down. And that was one of the first setbacks of the Japanese during that period. It happened again when the Japanese tried to cross New Guinea through the Kokoda Trail. The, by that time, the Australians, who were coming up from the south to meet them, were protected by Mepocrin, which the Australian and British armies had picked up, borrowed from the Germans, and um, uh, that was protecting them. Pamaquin was not protecting the Japanese. So a lot of stories can come out of that. Well, the, we were in a whole endemic area. The transmission in that area was just as intense as anything you would ever meet in, in tropical Africa. Uh, there was a big difference. We had nearly as much vivax as we had falciparum, and not much less malaria. It was a very fascinating country. Now we also know from, really from DNA studies, there's also ovale. I once, in thousands of blood films, saw a parasites I thought looked rather like ovale, but it was a thick film. I couldn't confirm it, and it was years, years later before some other teams that went out to that area um, discovered and proved there was a, an Ovali-like parasite circulating in that area, which is very interesting, because one thinks that these Ovali-like things, semi-Ovali and so on, normally would have some kind of uh, monkey or something as a basic um, host. There aren't any monkeys <coughs> east of the Wallace's line, that's right, isn't it? There were no monkeys in New Guinea. So where was the reservoir host? There wasn't a lot of human population movement, so it remains an open question. Anyhow, that's where we worked. Um, and we again, we set up uh, typical kind of uh, procedures which were uh, available to us at the time. We set up three in this pilot project near Marprick, near the area I've just been showing you. Um, again, I think we compare DDT deals in which our, Japan, which our Dutch colleagues have been testing also on their side of the border. Um, and we only had two drugs, three drugs, chloroquine and pyrimethamine to treat people with. We weren't using prophylaxis or primaquine, which we gave to some gametocyte carriers in the hope of reducing transmission. Um, it was not very valuable. Now, of course, we recognized and the Dutch recognized quite early on that using a lot of pyrimethamine uh, we weren't using combinations, we were using them individually. Pyrimethamine developed in falciparum very rapidly. Bang goes pyrimethamine. Chloroquine at that time was still okay for treatment. Primaquine, if, and people did tolerate primaquine better there than they would in, in West Africa, for example, because they didn't have um, a G6P deficiency. Now we know they had a, or have ovalocytosis, which protects them to some degree against uh, Vivex. That's another story which I won't go into. But we ended up doing this project, um, and before we um, did even start our program in that pilot project, I did a big survey on the Fly River, which is down in the south. And the Fly River actually runs along the border of what was in Dutch New Guinea and um, Papua. And I spent about a month on the river. Um, doing blood, you know, looking, getting blood films from the people, catching mosquitoes and all the usual things. We didn't attempt to start anything. And I came to the conclusion 
the obvious practical reason that it was an area where you were not going to be able to do a, a mass spraying campaign with never mind what insecticide, nor mass drug administration. We needed something different. And my thoughts then were, if we had an eta minor quinoline, which would stop transmission, particularly something you could give as a single drug at infrequent intervals, in, preferably in a depot, that would be one of the answers to the problem. That's what I wrote in a, a paper there in 1957. Um, that will jump you after in, in a moment to some of the newer drugs. Anyway, um, let me jump very far into the future and come to this interesting work by Karazinor and Al, which I think you've all been involved in, the development of Tazopsin, which I really need to ask you about, because um, this is, it sounds like a fascinating compound. As I understand it from the paper, it seems only to act on the hepatic stages, and I'm waiting for somebody here to tell me more about it. I think if it goes through all the hoops of toxicity testing, etc., 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 this may be a drug for the future. So I'll leave you to discuss this and David um, a little further along. Well, we went through the usual procedures in, in Marprec there. Uh, yes, so that, this was my, my wife who helped me to sort of, I won't say manage the teens, but she wasn't bad at getting under control. Um, there's our spray can, sprayers, you know, for the um, DDT or whatever it's going to be, and our Land Rover that was up on the hills above above uh, Weeway, above the coast there, in about 57. Very, very ingenious. Worked very well. You notice we were obeying all the instructions about protecting yourself when you're mixing DDT, etc., etc. <laughs> of course, we didn't, poison, we didn't poison anybody. Even a man, a villager, who decided this powder looked rather nice, he thought he'd do some cooking with it, and he survived. <laughs> but the, the later part of that story is that uh, even under those holoendemic conditions, very intense transmission, and this was judged by various parameters, including the very most sensitive one, the infant parasite rate, you could, if you sprayed properly, cut down the transmission. And I'm sorry this is a slightly complex slide, but <coughs> take my word for it, the decline means that we were cutting transmission down enormously until um, I left there in 19, or we left there in 1960. And uh, some bother to test the quality of the stuff, brought this in, sprayed it all over the area of the country which, where the campaign was being run, and within about two years, everything gone back up again. Bad DDT, bad malariologist, quote. Shows you really do have to be very, very careful. And that was still eradication days, remember? Eradication um, was put to sleep in 1969. Now, coming back to the question of the terrain, um, Highland, I mean, New Guinea goes up to some very high uh, areas where, where you have wonderful farmland and so on at about 2,000 metres and above. And uh, we had a malaria school set up not by me but by the former director of uh, health, uh, John Gunther, who eventually became the uh, governor of uh, Papua New Guinea before it was made independent. And um, the malaria school, uh, he had collectors who he trained from local villages and so on. And uh, they did a very good job. People came from all over Papua New Guinea to be trained there. Uh, people at all level went back and they carried out various levels of malaria control, we'll call it, as a general term. And the man who was running the school was a rather old Englishman who had been a former health inspector, but found his forte in, in uh, Minge, where they set the malaria school up. And he was called Christian by name, and he was Christian by nature. He was a man who believed that he should help people. And he wanted the villagers who were working with him there to get a bit of education. Fortunately, a few years after I left, the University of Papua New Guinea was set up. And he paid out of his own salary um, for some of his staff to get a higher education. This was one of the people who did. He, was, he could have been one of those little children running around in Minge when I was there. Uh, very interesting story. Um, only a few months ago, I received an e email from somebody called Billy Selby. I had no idea who he was. And he said, I've read your blog from April 2010 on my website. And he read something I put in there about malaria in New Guinea. And he told me a bit about his life history. <laughs> 
and that's in a nutshell. He became physician, did postgraduate work in Australia. At one time he was director of medical services from the Dang district. He's now um, still a young man but retired, can't get a job, can't get on with the government who won't do what he feels he, they should be doing from their control or call it what you like and malaria now still a very major problem in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's just an interesting story with various, <coughs> various lessons to be learned. That was the microscope which I think, I'm sorry I'm pointing at the microscope, and um, that's the lesson that can be learned. This was the microscope that Stan Christian used to use to teach his staff and um, uh, Billy has still got this in his sort of home. He now lives in Madang with a host of children, people who adopted him as father and a whole New Guinea story. You know, what they call one talks. People from your village will never desert you. They'll always be your children. He's got, I don't know how many living with him now, educating a lot. It's a very interesting story. But the <coughs> bigger story in a sense is that they converted the whole of that highland area to a wonderful agricultural area, partly with basic drainage, partly with spraying, partly with other measures which were appropriate for the area. And the highlands of uh, New Guinea now not the most prosperous part of the whole country. Uh, the western end um, is an international airport, bringing in thousands of tourists, vast amount of income for the country, and of course the, the, the growing coffee, the, even I'm very pleased to say breeding butterflies, that's one of my loves, uh, which they sell to the tourists, the beautiful bird wing butterflies, and all manner of things they're, they're doing to improve the income and the well-being of the whole country. So that's a sort of sideline, but I think a rather fascinating one. Um, right, now, switching quite deliberately to another part of the world, because one tends to forget there's also a lot of malaria in, in, in South America. There was, of course, in North America at one time. Um, and uh, one of the things I've never forgotten was uh, the reversal in the ratio. This is difficult to understand when you look at it, but just, but just listen to me the reversal of the ratio of the two different parasites when falciparum became resistant to chloroquine. For a time, chloroquine was behaving very, very nicely, went down. What came up instead? Ibex. Shot up. Uh, for a variety of reasons, I'll leave you to ponder on. So when you do start interfering seriously with the transmission of a particular parasite, or the parasite changes its response to a particular drug, all kinds of things can happen that you probably would never have forecast. And that was one of them. Another, I think, very informative story is the, what I call the collapse of the eradication program in India. Uh, when I first visited the um, Malaria Institute of India, and I think it was 1954, probably on our way to Nepal, um, they had embraced the idea of trying to eradicate malaria from India. There were millions of cases every year at that particular period. Um, the government took this on board. They were going to follow the eradication procedures. They had a wonderful man called Colonel Jasmine Singh, who was the director. He was at the original Indian Army Medical Service. But he became the director of the program, working from the Malaria Institute of Delhi. <coughs> and this program worked phenomenally well. And the numbers of cases of malaria in Toto just went right down for about um, uh, 10, 12 years. And then Mrs. Gandhi, I think it was, decided that they didn't need to devote money to just controlling one disease. We'll use all that money for something else. Not a bad choice, family planning. So no money for malaria, money up for family planning. And what happened to malaria? I went back a few years later, bang, right up again. You read the individual reports coming in on your epidemiology websites. Uh, you talk to people who know the area. There's a hell of a lot of malaria, particularly in the east in Orissa State and so on in malaria yet again. So there's another problem people are going to have to think about. Fortunately it's not me now. Well, of course one of the big flies in the ointment um, <laughs> was the emergence of chloroquine resistance first in South America and at the same time in Thailand. And um, I went to I, I was already doing work on chloroquine resistance in, in Bergiae because I'd seen the writing on the wall. And um, I went to this meeting in Antwerp at the Tropical Institute 
and all the good and the wise were there. That, among other things, I presented work we'd done on um, chloroquine resistant um, bergii, where we'd shown that these very interesting parasites didn't have any pigment. So, at the end of a couple of years, it became apparent that somebody got to do something about getting some new drugs. It also happened that there was a war emerging in uh, Vietnam. And we needed, the Americans were particularly concerned because a lot of their troops were coming down with Falsupin, which was not responding to chloroquine. What else was there? Quinine. Where do you get quinine from? Very, very difficult to get quinine. New synthetic drugs, where do we go for those? So they set up this enormous program under the auspices of the Walter Reed Institute. And they really <coughs> did the business there. People, David Jacobus, for example, um, went around the world looking for people who got potentially antimalarial compounds, any old thing would do as long as they had a chance to uh, um, test them. But that was the meeting in, in 1967. They came up with all kinds of wonderful suggestions, the most useful of which was the, uh, this in vivo test for chloroquine response. And that came out in the report of that particular meeting. Guess who drew that? <laughs> Not me, I drew the original and somebody drew it up properly. But um, that was a very useful tool in the field for people who got malaria, who were treated with this drug or other drugs, and it was a way of sort of um, formulating the overall response to that drug or the lack of response. And it was meaningful, it was practical, and probably it's still used today as far as I know. This was the, the rescue helicopter throwing out a life belt saying combinations. And that was a little cartoon drawn by one of my young lady technicians many years later when she knew that I was mad on combinations. I thought it was rather sweet, I'd show it to you. <laughs> so, what kind of combination could be used? Now, these are more or less um, self-explanatory. I'll just remind you that in um, Vietnam, and also I think in, in Korea, um, in the Korean War, as a prophylactic, the army decided they were going to use single weekly dose called the CP tablet. I think it was 300 milligrams of chloroquine and 45 milligrams of primaquine. Seems like a big dose. They, of course, were worried about you know, getting uh, um, people suffering from G6P deficiency getting hemolysis. It didn't actually happen. They got very few side effects from this, even among uh, American troops who were G6P deficient. Very interesting. Um, and that, was a, that succeeded to a very large degree in preventing the re-establishment of malaria back in the United States with all these repatriated soldiers. So there again is a lesson that has been forgotten should be considered again. Right, okay, back to today, part of the very active interest, I believe, of MMV, and that is the development fundamentally from methylene brew all the way through pamaquin, through primaquin, up to Fenequin, which um, I think we're going to have somebody, don't forget this was picked up in originally uh, as an offshoot of the NIH program in 1953. I think I forgot to mention, by the way, that the big wall to read program didn't screen, what was it, I said 12,000 compounds or something? 350,000 odd compounds were screened in that program. Enormous number. There were a lot of them were screened in rodent malaria, in vivo, a thing called the RAIN test, by, run by Louis RAIN in, in Florida. A very crude test, but nevertheless threw up a lot of leads, um, and our, ourselves among others, um, but an enormous number of compounds. And then, of course, when it became available, the in vitro screening made possible by uh, Traeger and Jensen. Um, this again uh, really illustrates the possibility of using combinations of potentiating compounds working against certain stages. And the value of that is demonstrated in practical um, work done in Vietnam, again mostly by Bob Black, uh, where soldiers were coming down like mad when they were just given chloroquine as prophylactic and when progranul was added to that, the numbers of new infections went down radically. Now you could draw your own conclusions from that. It's a very interesting practical observation. Okay, now we move a jump ahead in many ways to the story of um, Qinghao, Qinghao Su, and so on.
Um, the Chinese, of course, were very concerned with the possible spread, an actual spread, of chloroquine resistant falciparum malaria over the border from Vietnam during the Vietnam War. They were suffering from it um, a great deal in, in southern China. They really didn't know what to do. And Chairman Mao set up a program within China, very, I don't want to comment on the program, but it actually worked, and um, in the 70s really, and they did what the Chinese do best, they looked at natural products. And one of the many things that they looked at was Artemisia annua, which was Ching Hao, and um, um, I'll say no more. But um, I went out, I, this was first published in English in 1979 in the Chinese Medical Journal, and I hopped on the bandwagon, went out to see what was going on, um, and what, if anything, I could do in collaboration with the Chinese. I had very interesting, very valuable meetings with Chinese workers in Beijing in 1980 and in Shanghai, and came back with two Chinese in my pocket. In other words, I had two Chinese workers allocated to study with me in London, in the lab. In, uh, they came over in 1981, I think. Gu Haoming and uh, Li Tse um, The This is just a book, a beautiful book, which I was given when I was over there, in fact, with all the then known good Chinese traditional medical plants. Lovely book. Sitting in my desk if you haven't pinched it. Um, I went into the farm, now I can go back and tell the truth. I went into the pharmacy like who was it today showed me and came back with a bottle where well, in fact it wasn't, it was a small plastic bag of dried powder. And they, I asked them what's this good for and they said oh just about everything, you know, fever, carbuncles, you name it, infertility, wonderful drug. So I said thank you very much, that's what I need. Um, took it home with me and you saw the plant which grew from it in my, in my conservatory, as I say, with my wife's tender loving care, and not a gardener. Um, the earliest formulations that Chinese workers had at that time were um, capsule form of artemisin in itself and an injectable form in oil. And um, they were not terribly good because it was very poorly absorbed. Even the oily preparation was poorly tolerated, difficult to give, and not all that marvelous. But in the meantime, the Chinese were working on analogues of artemisinin, and they came up with a whole bunch of them, including artiether, artemether, artesunate, and various others, um, some of which they very generously sent over for me to study in London. So really, we did the first um, research on the whole series outside China and outside uh, Vietnam um, uh, on this whole series. Uh, during that period, we came up with various um, interesting thoughts, which I've given you here just as sort of quick references. I won't even uh, read it all about it at the moment, but you can see we covered a whole bunch of different things, including the evolution of tefenoquin, and a totally unrelated um, bit of work not done by us at all, done by some American workers very recently, which I picked up on the internet, where they were using ivermectin, as you can see, as drug administration to people with um, uh, liver blindness and they found that it disrupted transmission of the malaria parasites which were biting people, uh, sorry, biting animals, they were biting people who were being treated with ivermectin. So I thought here's a lovely illustration of a triple drug action, even against two different parasites. Again, that hasn't been followed up. I sent them a little congratulatory note on my website I'm um, not sure if I got an acknowledgement or not, probably nobody reads the website, which is quite common. Um, anyhow, we were still looking, uh, no, sorry, we, we were then thinking back, well, Plasmodium falciparum is not the only parasite in man. Um, there's a great deal of Vivax around, and uh, Kevin Baird, of course, is one of the people who's been promoting <coughs> most of the work in recent years, in collaboration, I believe, with yourselves, on the... Uh, drugs against Vivax. I hardly need to say more about that, you know more about it than I do, and um, perhaps somebody will talk to that later. But it's quite clear that you had to have a totally different approach with Vivax, which I understand um, is actually increasing in, uh, in uh, my looking for pathogenicity. As falciparum comes down, Vivax comes up, which is not surprising, and it is more virulent, it seems, 
than it ever was before in some areas. And we look forward to hearing some comments on that. And of course, the, it's the only one which has a hypnozoite stage against which, at the moment, the primaquin is the only effective uh, drug. But even then, not used on its own. People forget that. To fenicoin, I mention again because it did seem from our own work even that it was active probably against all the different stages in falciparum. We don't know yet, I think, whether it's active against a hypnozoite. Um, I, I'm mad on this business of combinations. <coughs> we, we tried out a series of combinations, including this triple combination of chlor, progranul, and dapsone, which itself is potentiating, and not tessunate. What effect could this have on the emergence of drug resistance in our own model, in this case, plasmodium sherbodi? Um, if you sort of move from left to right, the, uh, the slope of the line indicates the degree of protection, <coughs> if you like, uh, against this, um, the emergence of resistant parasites. And as you go on to a, a two-component combination, so you, you increase the time it takes for parasites to, to develop resistance, when you get up to a triple combination, um, it, the parasites have a hard time overcoming it. And this actually was going into clinical trial uh, via the welcome, if I understand it, and then somebody got up and said, oh, you can't use Dapsone, it's going to kill everybody. When I think of how many people with leprosy are living on Dapsone, it makes me wonder about this kind of conclusion. Uh, and incidentally, I haven't got it on the slide, let me draw another lesson here. Uh, many years ago, I was at a meeting of, of TDR, I think I was the chairman of Kemal at the time, and we were talking about the development of a combination of pyrimethamine sulfadoxine, that's Fancidar, with mefloquine. Because for a variety of, what well, we thought, very valid reasons, we felt this would be a very good triple combination to use to fight against uh, transmission, to prevent the resistance of mefloquine emerging, and to prevent resistance developing to the pyrimethamine sulfadoxine. And some bright person in this particular meeting got up and said, oh, you can't use sulfadoxine. It's a long-acting sulfonamide. Everybody's going to get terrible skin disease, as, as you know well can happen rarely with long-acting sulfonamides. What is one of the commonest antimalarials in use today? Sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. So there's another lesson, I think, a lot of people bear in mind. Apart from my book, I don't think it's ever been published. It was too sensitive a topic. Um, I could go on a long time about that. Anyhow, um, once the artemisinin uh, combination therapies began to get popular, um, the one which uh, got there first, if you were, was the one developed by Novartis together with the Chinese, and that was lumethantrine. Um, what's the B? What's the Benflumatol. Benflumatol and artemisa. Um, Artemisa, I can understand, then Flumatol, we again looked at it, I think, before anybody else outside China. They sent it to us. It was obviously a highly effective drug. And uh, as I say, the Novartis people, nothing to do with me, they worked along with the Chinese and developed the Co-Artemisa, which is, I think, the first ACT to be authorized, as it were, by WHO. Is that right? Uh, now, of course, I see that the Indian uh, uh, pharmacologists are working on a combination, I think it's Artemisa, with mefloquine. Uh, this, is, this raises a number of questions in my mind because one of our good colleagues, whose name I won't mention, uh, was one of the first to say you can't use a combination of artemisinin and mefloquine in Thailand because there's already resistance to mefloquine. You can ask yourself the question I ask myself. Okay, overall estimates you name it, you'll find a different estimate. The actual problem imposed by malaria, even today, that was 1990, hasn't changed all that much. Um, what are the main parasites in man today? Well, okay, in Africa, mainly falciparum is the problem. But why back, look, it's all over the blooming place. Vast amounts of it in Latin America, in the Western Pacific, in, say, in, in Central Asia, and so on. But the expenditure on research for these two parasites 87, 97% generally speaking going to falciparum, 3 point something percent to Vivax. Uh, 
Now there, I think, is also a lesson for MMB. What are stumbling blocks today? Rapid transport of pathogens, including malaria parasites, including mosquitoes, actually. We have some funny stories about people getting uh, falciparum malaria in the middle of France and, and um, in a pub near Heathrow and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, fairly obvious that probably mosquito came on board as well without a ticket, uh, but we fell super. Global warming. People scorn at this. If you look at the recent papers, you'll find that some studies done on malaria in birds, and malaria in birds goes up to quite cold climates, has been studied recently in Alaska at different latitudes, isn't it? Not long, yeah, latitudes in Alaska. And it is now apparent that malaria is going in birds higher and higher northwards in that particular well-studied area. So don't tell me that global warming isn't having practical consequences in relation to the development of malaria, at least in birds. So I think it's a very real potential problem for the coming decades, whether we like it or not. Okay, advances in scientific knowledge, we, that was what we first knew about the parasites and the funny things growing in red cells, as we learned in 1981. We've now got the genome of falciparum beautifully sequenced and so forth. And where are we? How do we manage malaria? Okay, there's your basic structure. Human population, education, housing, vaccination, query, drugs, Prevent resistance using combinations, in particular if you have to. For prophylaxis, in some cases, therapy of course. The vectors, insecticides, impregnated nets, fine, but already producing problems. House spraying, one time no, thanks to a certain lady who wrote a book about DDT. Now, fortunately, people are seeing sense again, starting to use DDT for internal spraying. Lava siding probably has a place in certain very limited geographical areas. But what little is said about at the moment, or there are one or two papers coming out, you know, an insecticide is just a drug against mosquitoes. So why not combinations of insecticides? Well, one reason people say there aren't an awful lot of drugs to go, of insecticides to go around. Mm -hmm. So it needs, I think, a lot of investment in insecticide research. And of course, going back to real basic land management in relation to the vectors. Um, so there you are, I said the last word, and you can read that to yourselves. Ten cents to the person who gets to the end first. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. That's it. Thank you very much.